Hello everybody, hope everybody's doing well. Things are always busy in my life between work and family and studying and whatnot. And you know, I don't do videos for a while and then I just get the itch to, to do a couple. And this is just the way it is here. I've already spoken of uh, good teaching ministries that you could go and watch in the meantime, such as uh, the Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. That's the one I study with the most because I just like his approach to to how he teaches the word. He was a no nonsense type preacher, and I respect people like that that say it as it is. So, but for today, we're going to look at the first resurrection and the second resurrection because there's a lot of myths and fables and fairy tales that are circulated as to what happens when we die, and you know where do you go when you die? You know, a lot of people teach you that if you're a Christian and you're not a sinner, then you go to heaven, and everybody else, while well, they immediately go to hell, don't pass go, don't collect $200, and that's where you just burn like a piece of bacon for all eternity. But that's not what the Word of God actually teaches. Yes, there absolutely is a hell, but that doesn't even take place until after Jesus returns and the thousand years are finished. Then we have the great white throne judgment, and then all those that are not found written in the book of life that have taken part in the first resurrection or the second resurrection, then they get cast there. And they don't just burn there for all eternity. They just are simply blotted out. It's like burning a piece of wood. The wood turns into ashes and that's it. It will never be a piece of wood. It will just be ashes. Same thing with those souls. They'll never be a soul again. They're just burnt up, blotted out. That's what the word of God says. I know that's not what Hollyweird says. I know that's not what the majority of uh, churches teach. But let's go by the Word of God. In the Word of God, it says that there's going to be a famine in the end times, the generation we're living in now. And it was going to be a famine for bread or water, but for hearing the true Word of God. Why? Because it's no different than what it was when Jesus walked the earth and uh, the church was in absolute apostasy. They had the Son of God standing before them that was foretold in the law and the prophets you know raising people from the dead healing the blind curing leprosy uh feeding multitudes of a few loaves of bread and a few fishes and he's doing all these things and uh and they wanted to murder him why because they didn't know any better and some of them did know better but it's the same thing today the majority of the churches are not teaching the truth of god's word they're not teaching what's going to happen just before jesus returns you know, did you know that the Antichrist is Satan himself coming here claiming that he's Jesus Christ? Have you been taught that? Well, it's written all throughout the Word of God. Most people are taught they're not even going to be here for the tribulation. They're taught that uh, the first one that appears claiming to be Christ is Jesus. When the Word of God says the first one that comes here claiming to be Christ is Satan. And God has said it so. It's to test his children. That's why it's called the hour of temptation. But anyway, I'm going to try not to get worked up because I've been told that I'm hateful and miserable on these videos. Well, I'm not hateful. I'm not miserable. I'm just a straightforward kind of person. And to be honest with you, when I look at the situation going on in the world today, it, it is a little depressing. You know, I just got approved for a, uh, a mortgage and I'm looking around at houses and I can't find anything for less than, you know, two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand dollars $250,000. And I, I have to live an hour and a half away from my job site in order to afford a house. You know, this international worldwide communism that's coming in is taking over my country. You know, it's, it's taken over the world. Satan's little satanic system of socialism, communistic atheism. Do a little bit of research on communism and atheism. There's enough people doing uh, videos on YouTube so you can learn all about it so you can understand why we are in the situation that we are in now this has already happened in the past and not that long ago do a little bit of real research on World War one and two the Bolshevik Revolution things like that I'll open your eyes real quick do a little bit of googling what is Freemasonry what is the Illuminati what is the Kabbalah what is the synagogue of Satan you know do a little bit of research Spend your little bit of, a, a little bit of your time looking into things like that. A lot of people, they just walk around their whole lives not knowing and understanding any, anything, thinking that, that oh, the world's just fine and dandy. I was one of them till not too long ago. And it's certainly not fine and dandy. So let's, let's get into this study. And I'm doing this to honor my Heavenly Father. 
Yahweh, and his son, Jesus Christ, which was Emmanuel, God with us. God was with us in the flesh as the man, Jesus Christ. And this is uh, why I'm doing this, to honor him and hoping to help somebody to draw people to him, certainly not to myself. So for this, we're going to start in First uh, Peter chapter 3, and we're going to talk about the first resurrection, what exactly took place when Jesus died for our sins on the cross, that if we repent and believe upon him, we have eternal life. You know, what happened to all those that died before Jesus Christ paid the price on the cross? What happened to them? Do you think the Word of God tells us what happened to them? Well, of course it does. The Word of God teaches us everything. It's just whether or not have you read with understanding. And that's the whole purpose of me trying to do this. It's just trying to... Uh, to help somebody see and, and draw them to God. So we're going to go to 1 Peter chapter 3 and uh, verse 18. And we're going to learn what happened when Jesus uh, died on the cross and was buried and resurrected on the third day. What did he do for those th those three days when he was in quote unquote what, what people teach as hell? For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. What spirits in prison? Well, you read in the four Gospels, you don't ever hear about Jesus going in and preaching to people in prisons. We're talking about spiritual bodies, those that have died in the flesh and their spiritual bodies went immediately to heaven which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. A lot of the times you got to pick up on the subject to understand what's being spoken of. What's the subject? Uh, when Jesus was in the grave for three days and he went all the way back to those in the days of Noah and preached to them, those that were in hell, you know, not a place of fire and burning, you know, we're going to, Jesus teaches about this as well in Luke chapter 16. That's where we're going after this to expand upon this a little bit. The like figure whereon to even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. That's right. He's king of king and lord of lords. And he's waiting until all his enemies are made his footstools. Well, who's going to do that? We're going to do that. We're going to share the real word of God. We're going to prepare ourselves for the Antichrist to show up, claim that he's Jesus. We're not going to premeditate what we're going to speak. We're going to allow ourselves to be delivered up. And the Holy Spirit is going to speak through us in a language understood by any man that hears it. Uh, I'm going to be speaking English, and somebody French is going to be hearing me speak French. This has already happened in Acts chapter 2. Go read it for yourself. It's there. That is the Holy Spirit speaking through somebody. Not gobbledygook or turkey calls or whatever they want to call it in the church houses. It's not true. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh of the lust of men, but to the will of God. Well, yes, if you claim to be a Christian, you're supposed to turn away from sin and try to live for God and how we do that. We keep his commandments to the best we can to be kind towards others when kindness is deserved and also kindness from your own heart, you know, helping the poor, whatever the case may be. You're certainly not meant to be a footstool by atheistic type people who think that you're uh, an idiot because you believe in God. Are you supposed to cower down to them? I don't think so. Nobody's going to push me around. They shouldn't push you around either. Use common sense in all things, right? For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, access of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Yeah, I definitely lived that life. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You know, I was a little thief. Got thrown, my, uh, got thrown into prison for fist fighting. You know, all kinds of terrible things I brought upon myself. So I know all about this. Wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same access of riot speaking evil of you. 
yeah, when you turn away from that type of lifestyle and all those people you used to hang out with and party with, this, that, and the other, they're going to start thinking differently of you. You know, you're going to be the weirdo. You know, what's wrong with this guy? They'll talk bad about you, usually behind your back. That you, that you, usually is the way that people do things. They like to talk behind your back or make their little uh, innuendos about you. You know, the little private jokes that you're not invited to, usually when other people are there so they can laugh and snicker with you standing right there like a bunch of cowards. I've experienced that many times in my life. <clears throat> Who shall give account to them that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. What was the subject? We were talking about what Jesus did when he spent three days and three nights in the grave, when he went to those souls all the way back to the time of Noah and offered salvation to them, because God is fair in all things. And it wouldn't be fair for us to have salvation offered by our simple faith, belief, and repentance if God didn't go all the way back to those souls that died before this was offered, the second covenant. And this is why the gospel was preached to them that are dead, those that were dead in the flesh body and dead spiritually, not literally dead, but they had not received salvation without Jesus Christ we are not alive. It is through Christ, Christ that we have eternal life. And until we accept him, we are dead. There's a whole lot of walking dead people walking around right now. That they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. So yes, when Jesus went into the grave, he went and preached to those that were in prison, quote unquote hell, where they're not sitting there burning for all eternity. They're literally sitting there waiting for judgment and Jesus gave this to us in a parable in Luke chapter 16 and chapter 15 we learn about uh, the parable of the prodigal son the son that never left that stuck with with the father the entire time symbolizing God and his elect those that had never left him from the beginning when the rebellion took place in the age that was if you don't understand what I'm talking about do some research on the three world ages Pastor R. Murray teaches about it all the time in the Shepherd's Chapel. I did a quick study on it. This is more of an evangelical ministry. I don't teach chapter by chapter, verse by verse. I suggest those of you that want deeper understanding, study with the teacher that teaches chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Uh, Just Thought Studies is another good one. Uh, Mark 13 Records is another good one. These channels you can find on YouTube. And if uh, you prefer to read, uh, theseason.org is a good one that you can read a commentary you're just basically reading the king james version of the bible with a commentary explaining what it means underneath it it takes you deeper into the word of god the types and examples the figures of speech the analogies symbolism the various methods that god teaches once you learn these things well then you can start to understand what the word of god really says opposed to what men teach as what they believe the word of god says because there's a big difference <coughs> Excuse me. So anyway, the, the, par, the parable of the prodigal son and the son that left went into the world was basically the one that goes into the world and follows the ways of the world. And Satan is the prince of this world. And after a while, he finally got fed up of uh, his life being in total disarray and came back to the father. And the father welcomed him with open arms. Well, that's exactly what God will do for you. If you repent of your sins in Jesus' name and get your life together, he'll welcome you back with open arms. And that's exactly what our Father wants from us because he loves us and he wants our love in return. Real love, not fake crap. Because he knows the thoughts in your own mind. He knows by your actions whether or not you're legitimate or not. So let's read what uh, Jesus says about what hell is and what hell isn't. <clears throat> Because we're trying to figure out the first resurrection. This is the whole point of this. The first resurrection is uh, when you die in Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. And those in heaven now that have died since Jesus was crucified, and when Jesus went to those people that were in the grave in hell and carried them across the gulf that believed upon him, 
They've all taken part in the first resurrection. And whoever dies today in Jesus' name has taken part in the first resurrection. And those that are alive and remain spiritually, when Jesus returns, when everybody's changed in their spiritual bodies, you can read of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, they take part in the first resurrection. Then we have a thousand year period and then judgment. Well, that's what we're going to learn about next. What happens during that thousand year period? Why doesn't judgment just take place immediately when Jesus returns? Well, there's more to it than what you've probably been taught in the local church houses. Anyway, let's take this a little bit further about uh, what happens when a soul dies that isn't in Jesus Christ. And he said also unto the disciples, there was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him they had wasted his goods. And he called him and he said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For the Lord taketh away me from the stewardship. I cannot dig to beg I am ashamed. <coughs> Sorry, I'm reading the wrong parable here. Sorry, let me start over again in uh, verse 19 here. Try to save on a little time. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at the gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. You can see this today with the sons of Cain, the synagogue of Satan, the Rothschilds, uh, all those people that own all the wealth of the world, they're all their multinational corporations, they own all the media, they have taken over the educational institutions, they have taken over religion, they take over everything, they own the world, and they just live sumptuously here, while the rest of us are heavily taxed. Every dollar I earn here, 50% 50, 50 of it goes to taxation here in Canada, so they just take and take and take. They keep raising the price of living. You know, you're lucky if you can get a, an apartment nowadays around here for $1,000 for one bedroom apartment. Houses, uh, try to rent a house at sixteen, eighteen, two thousand dollars $2,000 a month. Figure out that's quite a bit of money and try to afford that off $18, $19, $20 an hour. It's nearly impossible. They live sumptuously while we scrap and beg for scraps from their table. And it came to pass that the beggar died, and he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. There's two sides to hell here. Basically, where's hell? It's in heaven, and it's just a holding place for souls that didn't overcome. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am in torments in this flame. What flame? The flame of shame and which water? The living water, which is Jesus Christ. He lived his whole life sumptuously and he didn't care about anything to do with God. All he cared about was himself and his life of richness and luxury, just like a lot of us do this day and age. Well, by then it's too late. But he's certainly not burning yet. The great white throne judgment hasn't even taken place yet. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, fixed us in you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from thence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. In other words, in heaven... When you're in paradise with our Heavenly Father, with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, you're there. You can't cross over to where those souls that did not overcome are. They are waiting for the millennium. They are waiting for the end of the millennium for judgment. And if they're lucky, they can take part in the second resurrection. We're getting to that. We're still talking about what exactly happens when we die. The first resurrection, those that partake in it, and those that didn't overcome, where they go. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, 
lest they come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto them, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father, Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. No, Jesus went there himself, the Son of God, God himself, and they didn't listen to him, and most people won't. They want, they're going to learn some hard lessons, and our Father is going to practice some tough love with people. That's the whole purpose of being here, is to be tested. And in my opinion, because of the rebellion that took place in the age that was, you know, apparently those third of the souls wanted to worship somebody other than God. They wanted to worship Satan. Well, they get to live in a world where God is in control, but he allows all this evil to take place. Isn't it a fun place to live? It is, I guess, if you're in La La Land and you don't give two hoots about nothing but yourself. It's a wonderful place. But to me, I don't think it's all that great. So the first resurrection. Well, all those that die in Jesus Christ take part in the first resurrection. Even those that believed upon him when he was in the grave, in hell. What Jesus explained what hell was. is just a place in heaven where souls that didn't overcome were held. Well, he went to them, preached to them, and any that believed, he brought them across into paradise people don't want to hear that but it's the truth it's the word of god study for yourself don't believe what i say and of course pray and ask our father for for guidance with these things now we're going to go to the second resurrection and what exactly is that when does it take place it takes place after jesus returns after the whole world winds up worshiping satan thinking he's jesus christ and whoever overcomes that overcomes it when the holy spirit speaks through God's elect, and they take part in the first resurrection. Everybody else is literally, spiritually, or should say literally, spiritually dead for the thousand years. And they are judged by their works. Why? Because this is going to be a time of discipline, a time of teaching. God's elect are literally going to be teaching those souls that are spiritually dead, that were deceived their entire lives. They could care less about worrying about what God had to say. They're too busy with their lives. And then the ones that actually do care about hearing about God, they get sucked into one of these honey traps called a church where they teach the doctrines of men, not what God's word says. <coughs> so let's read Revelation chapter 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Remember, this Jesus Christ has returned at this time. And he laid hold on on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Why would he bind him a thousand years? Why wouldn't he just destroy him right then and there? Because he's still going to be used at the end of the millennium. After the people are taught during the millennium, those that didn't take part in the first resurrection, to get their acts together, because Satan's going to be released, and they're going to have that choice again, whether to stand with God or stand with Satan. And the incredible thing is, there's many that are still going to follow Satan after a thousand years of knowing the truth. There's going to be no more lies, no more crap like there is today, where everything is a lie. Everything about your life is a lie. Well, it's not going to be that way during the thousand year millennium. So those that decide to follow Satan then, you know, see you later. Adios. And cast him in the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. Well, why should Satan be loosed a little season? Because, just like I said, God is going to use him for the final culling out of the wheat and the tares, before the tares are going to be burnt in the lake of fire, which simply means to be blotted out. There's going to be more people saved in the millennium than I'm guessing all the times here since Jesus was crucified all the way back to the beginning when he went and preached to them. Why? Because there's going to be no excuse then. They're all going to be in their perfect spiritual bodies. They're going to be taught the truth. They're going to know it. It's not going to be, oh, I wonder if God is real or not. It's not going to be like that. Everybody's going to know that God is real. And I saw thrones. And they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark, upon their foreheads or in their right hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. 
What is this mark of the beast? Well, it's certainly not a microchip you get in your hand. What is in your forehead? It's your brain. It's your mind. It's what you think with. What is the seal of God? It goes in your mind. It's your brain. It's what you think with. It's the word of God. It's knowing the prophecies. It's knowing the real truth about things. The mark of the beast is the opposite. It's having Satan's lies and deceptions in their forehead. Once we start seeing Satan and fallen angels showing up on this earth, doing supernatural miracles, claiming to be Jesus in the holy host of heaven, all those that haven't studied and don't have the seal of God in their forehead, they're at his mercy. And they're going to literally think that it's Jesus Christ. And he's coming in peacefully and prosperously, according to the book of Daniel, chapter 8 and 11. I suggest you go read those. It's not going to be a time of misery and hell on earth and people being slaughtered. It's not going to be a teddy bear picnic for God's elect, because they are going to be hated by everybody for standing against him. But they, they know in their minds that what they're doing is right. And they're hoping that when our Father speaks through them, that some of them are going to snap out of their spin. Or I would at least think that's why you would allow yourself to be delivered up. It's not just to serve God, but to want to help your feather or fellow Christians overcome the tribulation. <clears throat> and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, doing what? Teaching and preaching. Did you know that during the millennium, uh, Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48 speaks all about that 1,000 year millennium? It even tells you what you're going to be doing throughout that millennium, if you happen to be one of God's elect, <coughs> or those that overcome the tribulation. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such a second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go forth to deceive the nations that are on the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is of the sand of the sea. Imagine that. Even after the thousand years, when everybody that was spiritually dead, that did not overcome a multitude like that, Satan is able to gather together to fight against God and his people. Like, it's, it's unbelievable, but it's written, so it's going to happen. And they went up the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about. And the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven, and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night, forever and forever. This is just simply a figure of speech, which means their punishment is forever. They are going to be blotted out, brought to ashes. You can read of that in Ezekiel 28, when Satan is handed his death sentence. You can read of this. In Psalms 37, which is an acrostic psalm that talks about what happens with the wicked. God likens them to fat that drips off a spit onto the coals and turns to ashes, just goes up in smoke. And as far as the, the beast and the false prophet are concerned, what is the beast? It's the one world political system that we're in now. Satan's power structure upon the earth that we are in bondage to through education, economics, politics, and religion. They rule every facet of our lives. And when it comes in, it only comes into its full completeness when Satan is here as the false prophet. His role as false prophet, when he comes here claiming that he's Jesus Christ. He's the one that died on the cross for you. He's a pathological liar. And that's exactly what he's going to claim to be. It's not the Vatican. It's not the Pope. It's Satan himself. Go read Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the son of perdition. There's only one son of perdition. There's only one son that's been sentenced to perish by name in the entire Bible. And that is Satan Lucifer. Go read Ezekiel 28. <clears throat> And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no, there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now we're always taught that we're not judged according to our works because we're justified through grace and faith, which is true. 
But during the millennium, those souls that were dead, they worshiped Satan, they took the mark of the beast, and they're crying for the rocks and mountains to fall on them, to hide them from the face of the Lamb when Jesus Christ returns. They will be judged by their works during the millennium, whether or not they will stand against Satan then, as we just read, when Satan's released for that short season after the thousand years are finished. You can even read of it in Isaiah 14, speaks of what Satan is doing. What, when he's locked away, people are going to be walking around wondering, is this the man that deceived the nations? They're going to be looking upon Satan as he's there, locked away in the pit. Have you not been taught these things? It's written. That's why it's important for you to understand the entire word of God. Many of the prophecies given in uh, the Old Testament have not been fulfilled yet. But people will tell you, oh, you don't need to know, know the Old Testament. We're not under the Old Covenant. We're under the New Covenant. You don't even have to understand that. Well, that's funny. The Old Testament and the law spoke of Jesus Christ's first advent and his second advent, known as the Lord's Day, when Jesus Christ returns as King of King and Lord of Lords. So we're going to go read one of these Old Testament prophecies that have not been fulfilled yet, speaking about the millennium and what happens in the millennium. We're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 31, verse, th verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. Now, do you suppose this has come uh, to pass yet? Does everyone know the Lord in the world? Of course not. Not everybody knows the Lord. Only one third of the population claims to be Christian. And I would say a very, very small percentage of them really understand what the Word of God says. Yes, they understand what salvation is and that by believing upon Jesus Christ, they are saved. But as far as the meat of God's Word goes, they don't know any of it. They've been taught garbage, the traditions of men. This hasn't come to pass yet. <clears throat> That's just one place amongst many. Now let's finish this up in Ezekiel 44, which explicitly speaks about what happens during the millennium, what God's elect are going to be doing during the millennium. Remember what we read where uh, Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 20, we're going to be... Uh, Kings and priests. Well, let's read what's going to happen uh, during that thousand year millennium where uh, those that have taken part in the first resurrection are and those that are prepared, being prepared to take part in the second resurrection. Why Satan's locked away and all uh, Jesus' enemies have been made his footstool. And he brought me back the way of the gate and the outward sanctuary which looketh towards the east and it was shot. This is Ezekiel. Then said the Lord unto me, This gate shall be shut, it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter in by it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it, therefore it shall be shut. It is for the prince, the prince he shall sit, and it ain't bread with the Lord. He shall enter by the way of the porch of the gate, and shall go out by the way of the same. Then brought he me the way of the north gate, before the house, and I looked, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord, and I fell upon my face. And the Lord said unto me, Son of man, mark well, and behold with thine eyes, and hear with thine ears, all that I say unto thee concerning all the ordinances of the house of the Lord, and all the laws thereof, and mark well the entering into the house, even with every going forth the sanctuary. And thou shalt say to the rebellious, even to the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, O ye house of Israel, let it suffice you all your abominations. What abominations? 
All these Christians that claim to be Christians that worship Satan thinking he's Christ and even celebrated when the two witnesses were murdered in the streets of Jerusalem. <coughs> and that ye brought into my sanctuary strangers, uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh, to be in my sanctuary, to pollute it, even my house when ye offered my bread, the fat and the blood. And they have broken my covenant because of all your abominations. What's God talking about here? He's talking about all the false teachings that are taught in his house. What is his house? The many member body of Christ is his house. If you think it's a good idea to teach the word of God and not know what you're talking about, it's not a good idea at all because you'll be judged by every idle word that comes out of your mouth. Because judgment begins first at the pulpit. It's a very uh, humbling thing for me, myself, and I because... It scares the crap out of me because I certainly don't want to be wrong with the things that I teach because I didn't get into this because I want to teach lies. I prayed many times for Father to take this away from me if I'm deceiving people because I only want to share his truth, not my interpretation of what his truth is. You can study this for yourself. I suggest starting with a real teacher like Pastor Arnold Murray. I believe that's the one God chose to bring his true word forth to prepare us, to seal us, in our foreheads to prepare ourselves for when Satan is coming here claiming to be Christ. That's my own personal opinion, but I don't believe in chance and happenstance that a man like that that had a little congregation of 120 in Gravit, Arkansas, could have grown into the largest independent ministry in the world on television 24 hours a day. You'll never find a man on there on television teaching the way he did, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, and he got certainly a lot of flack for it. And ye have not kept the charge of mine holy things, but ye have set keepers of my charge in my sanctuary for yourselves. Thus saith the Lord God, no stranger uncircumcised in heart, nor uncircumcised in flesh shall enter into my sanctuary of any stranger that is among the children of Israel. And the Levites that are gone away far from me when Israel went astray, which went astray away from me after their idols, they shall even bear their iniquity. Yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary, having charge at the gates of the house, and ministering to the house. They shall slay the burnt offering and the sacrifice for the people, and they shall stand before them to minister unto them. Because they ministered unto them before their idols, and caused the house of Israel to fall into iniquity, therefore have I lifted up my hand against them, saith the Lord God, and they shall bear their iniquity. There's different thoughts on who these Levites are. Some people believe it's 144,000. I don't believe so. I believe it's those that overcome the tribulation, those that have taught falsehoods their entire life, but only come through it by the skin of their teeth from what the elect have to say. But that's my opinion, and I can most certainly be wrong, just like everybody else. But what's the point here? These are the ones that overcome, and they're going to be teaching during this time. Teaching who? Well, we're going to find out. And they shall not come near unto me to do the office of a priest unto me, nor to come near any of my holy things in the most holy place. But they shall bear their shame and their abominations which they have committed. But I will make them keepers of the charge of the house for all the service thereof, and for all that shall be done therein. But the priests, the Levites, the son of Zadok, that kept the charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me and minister unto me. And they shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat and the blood, saith the Lord God. Many people think that when Jesus returns, they're just going to run right up to him and, you know, give Jesus a big hug and tell him how much they love him. Well, not so. That's not what the word of God says. Only the sons of God, the Zadok, the upright, God's elect, the ones that stand against Satan the entire time and allow the Holy Spirit to speak through them. They're the only ones that are going to be allowed in the sanctuary where Jesus Christ is. Even these other Levites that are spoken of, they're not allowed to enter into the inner sanctuary where Jesus is. There's going to be a chain of command there. The Zadok, Jesus will command the Zadok. The Zadok will command the Levites, and the Levites will go out and teach the people, the spiritually dead. And the dead live not again until a thousand years were finished. Who are these dead? These are the ones that are going to be taught. We're getting to it. It's because it's interesting, the the privileges that the Zadok will be giving during that thousand years. <clears throat> they shall enter into my sanctuary, and they shall come near to my table to minister unto me, and they shall keep my charge. It shall come to pass that when they enter in the gates of the inner court, they shall be clothed with linen garments, and no wool shall come upon them, whilst they minister in the gates in the inner court and within. 
They shall have linen bonnets upon their heads, and they shall have linen breeches upon their loins. They shall not gird themselves with anything that causes sweat. And when they go forth into the utter court, even unto the other court to the people, they shall put off their garments wherein they ministered, and lay them in the holy chambers, and they shall put on other garments, and they shall not sanctify the people with their garments. Neither shall they shave their heads, nor suff their locks to grow long. They shall only pull their heads. Neither shall any priest drink wine when they enter into the inner court. I can assure you, uh, this wine they're talking about isn't grape juice. A lot of Christians even are taught that uh, having a drink of wine, you know, you're going to go to hell, you're a drunkard. That any time wine's mentioned or consumption of wine in the Bible is speaking about grape juice. Like it's time to get off the PG uh, Christianity and get into the Word of God. Common sense and uh, with everything. Neither shall they take for their wives a widow, nor her that is put away, but they shall take maidens of the seed of the house of Israel, or a widow that had a priest before. And they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and profane, and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. What are they doing? They're teaching the difference to the people, the holy and the profane. Holy God, profane Satan, while he's locked away for that thousand years. The ones that they worshipped that caused them to be spiritually dead. And in controversy, they shall stand in judgment, and they shall judge it according to my judgments, and they shall keep my laws and my statutes in all mine assemblies, and they shall hallow my Sabbaths. And they shall come at no dead person to defile themselves. What are these dead people that can't come near? They're the spiritually dead, those that worship Satan. But for father, or for mother, or for son, or for daughter, or for brother, or for sister that hath no husband, they might defile themselves. God is telling you here, if you had a brother or a sister, a mother or father, if you happen to be one of God's Zadok, one of his elect, that they worship Satan, they did not overcome. And you can see that they're making some really stupid, doing some stupid things during the millennium. You're allowed to go out and preach to them and tell them to get your act together because they're going to be judged by their works during the white, great white throne judgment. You know, whatever you've been taught about heaven and hell, a lot of it, I'm sure, is just not true. You know, we're simply reading from the Word of God here. And I advise you to study under a real teaching ministry, one that teaches chapter by chapter, verse by verse. I'm kind of jumping all over the place just to kind of paint a picture here to hopefully inspire you to get deeper into the Word of God for yourself. Because I can assure you that unless you come to God and you're willing to dig in for yourself, you're never going to come to the truth. <clears throat> and after he is cleansed, they shall reckon unto him seven days. You can't even go around God. That's a, a, a penalty that you face if you go and you speak to those spiritually dead family members of yours. You, you can't even be around Jesus Christ for seven days. Seven being spiritual completeness. And I'm not going to begin to try to explain why is it set up that way. Because who really understands the mind of God? The perfect creator in his ways we're never going to truly understand everything that goes on here why God does everything that he does but I know for certain everything that he does is for the better for those that love him so I don't know when I'm gonna do any more of these videos I think I might just get in back into the basics a little bit understand the difference between the six day creation the eighth day you know just simple little things like that to, understand you know when uh cain was uh exiled from adam and eve who did he go and marry and how was he able to build a city if adam and eve were the only ones that were alive uh, he already killed his brother abel who was he to marry well there's things that you have not been taught about god's word a lot of people do know and a lot of people certainly don't know so hopefully this has helped somebody i try to keep my attitude to a minimum but yeah i do get pretty pretty fired up about these uh topics because to me uh it is so very serious you know my life is pretty blessed and things you know i got lots to eat pre-approved for a mortgage and stuff and to be honest with you i'm kind of hoping that satan shows up here before i'm worrying about a mortgage but we certainly got to live our lives while we're waiting so 
Anyway, God bless you all. Hopefully this has uh, helped somebody. And get into the Word of God because this is all going to take place just as soon as those servants, those 144,000, are sealed with God's truth in their forehead. Then Satan and his angels are going to be cast out of heaven. Go read Revelation chapter 12. I'll tell you all about it. That certainly hasn't happened yet. So anyways, you guys have a blessed day.